Lingue originali La regina Elisabetta d'Inghilterra nell'interpretazione di Alan Bennett è stata una insolita lettrice An Uncommon Reader ed è The Uncommon Reader il titolo dell'opera che stiamo sfogliando a lingue originali il venerdì sera in compagnia di Marco Piovaz se eh, andate a cercare sul podcast o sul canale YouTube di Caffè Italia mh, un'altra nostra trasmissione, il tè delle 5, eh, beh, troverete anche una lettura in lingua italiana tratto da La Sovrana Lettrice, pubblicato in Italia da Adelphi, è la versione italiana di The Uncommon Reader, e scoprirete ehm, qual è il ritratto di questa regina di Inghilterra che eh, legge che legge e che eh, scoprendo il piacere della lettura comincia a incoraggiare tutta la, uh, la corte pur in ritardo ben trovati da Dario Albertini lingue originali l'appuntamento del venerdì sul canale streaming di Caffè Italia ma comunque sempre in podcast versione in lingua inglese siamo al terzo episodio e quindi al terzo estratto propostoci da Marco Piovaz da The Uncommon Reader di Alan Bennett The Queen, though, might have been less pleased had she known that Norman was unaffected by her because she seemed to him so ancient, her royalty obliterated by her seniority. Queen she might be, but she was also an old lady, and since Norman's introduction to the world of work had been via an old people's home on Tyneside, old ladies held no terrors for him. To Norman, She was his employer, but her age made her as much patient as queen and in both capacities to be humoured, though this was, it's true, before he woke up to how sharp she was and how much wasted. She was also intensely conventional, and when she had started to read, she thought perhaps she ought to do some of it, at least, in the place set aside for the purpose, namely the palace library. But though it was called the library and was indeed lined with books, a book was seldom, if ever, read there. Ultimatums were delivered here, lines drawn, prayer books compiled and marriages decided upon. But should one want to curl up with a book, the library was not the place. It was not easy even to lay hands on something to read, As on the open shelves, so called, the books were sequestered behind locked and gilded grills. Many of them were priceless, which was another discouragement. No, if reading was to be done, it were better done in a place not set aside for it. The Queen thought that there might be a lesson there, and she went back upstairs. Having finished the Nancy Mitford sequel, Love in a Cold Climate, the Queen was delighted to see she had written others, and though some of them seemed to be history, she put them on her newly started reading list, which she kept in her desk. Meanwhile, she got on with Norman's choice, My Dog Tulip, by J. R. Archerley. Had she met him? She thought more. She enjoyed the book, if only because, as Norman had said, the dog in question seemed even more of a handful than hers and just about as unpopular. Seeing that Ackerley had written an autobiography, she sent Norman down to the London Library to borrow it. Patron of the London Library, she had seldom set foot in it, and neither, of course, had Norman but he came back full of wonder and excitement at how old-fashioned it was, saying it was the sort of library he had only read about in books and had thought confined to the past. 
he had wandered through its labyrinthine stacks, marvelling that these were all books that he, or rather she, could borrow at will. So infectious was his enthusiasm, the next time, the Queen thought, she might accompany him. She read Achilles' account of himself, unsurprised to find out that, being a homosexual, he had worked for the BBC, though feeling also that he had had a sad life. His dog intrigued her, though she was disconcerted by the almost veterinary intimacies with which she indulged the creature. She was also surprised that the guard seemed to be as readily available as the book made out, and at such a reasonable tariff. She would have liked to have known more about this, but though she had equerries who were in the guards, she hardly felt able to ask. Edward Morgan Foster figured in the book, which whom she remembered spending an awkward half hour when she invested him with a CH. Mouse-like and shy, he had said little, and in such a small voice, she had found him almost impossible to communicate with. Still, he was a bit of a dark horse. Sitting there with his hands pressed together, like something out of Alice in Wonderland, he gave no hint of what he was thinking. And so she was pleasantly surprised to find on reading his biography that he had said afterwards that had she been a boy, he would have fallen in love with her. Of course, he couldn't actually have said this to her face, she realised that. But the more she read, the more she regretted how she intimidated people and wished that writers in particular had the courage to say what they later wrote down. What she was finding also was how one book led to another. Doors kept opening wherever she turned and the days weren't long enough for the reading she wanted to do. But there was regret, too, and mortification at the many opportunities she had missed. As a child, she had met Maysfield and Walter de la Mer. Nothing much she could have said to them. But she had met T.S. Eliot, too, and there was Priestley and Philip Larkin, and even Ted Hughes, to whom she'd taken a bit of a shine, but who remained nonplussed in her presence. And it was because she had, at that time, read so little of what they had written that she could not find anything to say, and they, of course, had not said much of interest to her. What a waste. She made the mistake of mentioning this to Sir Kevin. But Mum must have been briefed, surely. Of course, said the Queen. But briefing is not reading. In fact, it is the antithesis of reading. Briefing is terse, factual and to the point. Reading is untidy, discursive and perpetually inviting. Briefing closes down a subject. Reading opens it up. I wonder whether I can bring Your Majesty back to the visit to the shoe factory, said Sir Kevin. Next time, said the Queen shortly, where did they put my book? Having discovered the delights of reading herself, Her Majesty was keen to pass them on. Do you read, Summers? She said to the chauffeur en route for Northampton. Read, ma'am. Books? When I get the chance, ma'am. I never seem to find the time. That's what a lot of people say. One must make the time. Take this morning. You're going to be sitting outside the town hall waiting for me. You could read then. I have to watch the motto, ma'am. This is the Midlands. Vandalism is universal. With Her Majesty safely delivered into the hands of the Lord Lieutenant, Summers did a precautionary circuit of the motto, then settled down in his seat. Read. Of course he read. Everybody read. He opened the glove compartment and took out his copy of The Sun. Others, notably Norman, were more sympathetic. And from him she made no attempt to hide her shortcomings 
as a reader or her lack of cultural credentials altogether. Do you know, she said one afternoon as they were reading in her study, do you know the area in which one would truly excel? No, Mum. The pub quiz. One has been everywhere, seen everything. And though one might have difficulty with pop music and some sport, when it comes to the capital of Zimbabwe, say, or the principal exports of New South Wales, I have all that at my fingertips. And I could do the pop, said Norman. Yes, said the Queen, we would make a good team. Ah, well, they're all not troubled. Who's that? Who, Mum? The road not travelled. Look it up. Norman looked it up in the dictionary of quotations to find that it was Robert Frost. I know the word for you, said the Queen. Mum? You run errands. You change my library books. You look up awkward words in the dictionary and find me quotations. Do you know what you are? I used to be a skivvy, Mum. Well, you are not a skivvy now. You are my amanuensis. Norman looked it up in the dictionary. The Queen now kept always on her desk. One who writes from dictation, copies manuscripts, a literary assistant. The new amanuensis had a chair in the corridor, handy for the Queen's office, on which, when he was not on call or running errands, he would spend his time reading. This did him no good at all with the other pages. Who thought he was on a cushy number and not comely enough to deserve it? Occasionally a passing equerry would stop and ask him if he had nothing better to do than read. And to begin with, he had been stuck for a reply. Nowadays, though, he said he was reading something for Her Majesty, which was often true, but was also satisfactorily irritating and so sent the Aquarius away in a bad temper. The Uncommon Reader di Alan Bennett, un racconto breve pubblicato in Italia da Adelphi con il titolo de La Sovrana Lettrice. Questa è Lingue Originali. Vi ricordo i tre appuntamenti della settimana, quello con la lingua inglese che andiamo ora a concludere con Marco Piovaz, quello con Nadia Meroni del sabato sera dedicato alla lingua e alla letteratura tedesca, quello della domenica con Barbara Marchand per quanto riguarda la letteratura in lingua francese. Da Dario Albertini grazie per l'ascolto e appuntamento alla prossima puntata di Lingue Originali. Lingue originali